Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2017 Indonesia Update Conference. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. For the historians amongst you, this is the 35th Update Conference organised, as you know, by the ANU Indonesia Project in collaboration with the Department of Political and Social Change with the support of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Alistair Cox and I'm Head of Southeast Asia Maritime Division in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which covers Indonesia. This morning, I'd like in particular to welcome and acknowledge a number of distinguished guests. Former Indonesian ministers, uh, Professor Mari Pangestu and Professor Chatib Basri, both uh, co-conveners of this conference and strong supporters over many years of the Indonesia project. Indonesian ambassador to Australia, His Excellency Cristiato Legowo, colleagues from the Indonesian Embassy here in Canberra and senior officials are from other embassies and missions uh, here in Canberra. Uh, Professor Helen Suvel, uh, Sullivan, the uh, director of the Crawford School of Public Policy and uh, Indonesia, uh, Indonesia Project uh, colleagues. Uh, Dr. Arianto uh, Patunru, the main convener of today's conference together with uh, Ibu Mari and uh, Dede, uh, Associate Professor Budi Ressa Sudamo, the, uh, the former head of the Indonesia project over six very successful years, uh, Associate Professor Blaine Lewis, the new current head of the project, and many other dear friends and colleagues, including of course Professor Hal Hill, who are here with us today. Uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and previously AusAid, uh, has been very proud to partner with the ANU since uh, 1980 in support of the Indonesia project, which has, in the words of our former Secretary uh, Peter Varghese, who is now of course Chancellor of another great Australian educational institution, fostered a deep understanding of Indonesia within that still too narrow Australian constituency which takes a very serious interest in Indonesia. The project has played a vital role in giving us a framework for thinking about Indonesia, why it matters to Australia, and how it is changing. Work by project staff and many collaborators strengthens Australia's claim as a leading repository of knowledge about Indonesia outside the country and it brings together experts from both nations and provides informed analysis and a varied perspective or varied perspectives on the economic and social forces driving Indonesia's development. It provides independent second track advocacy to policymakers, reinforcing the importance of quality research contributing to stronger evidence-based decision making. In recent years, the project, as I in indicated before under uh, Pat Budi's uh, leadership, has been doing this very actively with energy and focus. Ladies and gentlemen, the theme of this year's update, Indonesia in the New World, Globalisation, Nationalism and Sovereignty, could not be more timely or relevant. The world, and in particular the Asia-Pacific region, is, as we all know, undergoing profound structural change as the rise of new powers in Asia is rebalancing strategic weight and power across the region with global implications. The world is shifting to an era of greater multipolarity where new and existing powers are competing for influence using a range of political, military and economic levers in differential ways. Non-state actors, including corporations, civil society organisations, religious and secular foundations, and a whole range of groups from human rights champions to terrorist cells, are using the power of new technologies, including communications technology, to exercise power in ways often well beyond 
their size. So how is Indonesia, one of the largest nations on earth, the largest Muslim majority democracy, adapting to and attempting to shape this new and emerging world order to advance and protect its interests and those of its diverse people? As the subtitle of the conference uh, suggests, elements in the mix are globalisation, nationalism and sovereignty. Indonesia as an archipelagic state at the nexus of the Pacific and Indian Oceans has always been at the centre of international trade, commerce and exchange, and influenced by successive waves of globalisation, certainly since and even before the age of commerce in the 15th and 16th century, and more recently in the era of the neoliberal ascendancy of the late 20th century. Indonesia's openness and international engagement has helped create the diversity of cultures, religions and outlooks that has been the hallmark of the modern republic since independence. But at the same time, the imperative to define and shape the diverse nation has created strong forces of nationalism, sometimes in reaction to the reality or perceived threat of external forces from the nationalism of the independent struggles in the 19th and 20th centuries to more contemporary concerns about national and group religious or ethnic identity. Sovereignty and control were very much to the fore during the nationalist struggle and after the end of the Second World War. But now, as the global order created after the war undergoes fundamental change, these issues are being highlighted once more from debates over maritime rights in neighbouring seas to questions of food and energy self-sufficiency. From the look of the agenda over the next couple of days, all of these issues are going to receive deep and insightful coverage and debate. From an Australian policy perspective, no set of issues can be more important than these. It goes without saying that how Indonesia engages with and adapts to the challenges of the new world will bear significantly upon us and our interests and policies. Beginning with the free and active policy enunciated by Dr Hatta in the early post-colonial era as the Cold War loomed, to the Wawasa Nusantara that was the base of archipelagic principle championed by Indonesia during the era of Dr Mokhtar Kusumat Maja, and through to Marty Natalagawa's dynamic equilibrium of the 21st century, thinking about external policy in Indonesia has often been conceptual and profound. Recent administrations or recent Indonesian administrations have provided a range of contrasting and uh, different approaches, political, strategic, economic, to the emerging world order suggesting that current thinking is still in a state of considerable flux. So we look forward to the analysis and insights from this update to help us further understand and interpret the directions of Indonesia's engagement with the world as it evolves and hope that it can provide ideas, including to us in government, about how to engage more effectively. So let's now move to our first presentations, um, which bring us right up to date with the political and economic developments in Indonesia since we met here last September. But before doing so, uh, briefly I'd like to again pay particular tribute to Associate Professor uh, Budi Resa Sudamo, who recently stepped down as head of the Indonesia project uh, on our behalf um, as the partner in the project for his tireless and effective work in leading it over the last six years and welcome Blaine Lewis to the role. And so now I would like to um, acknowledge, also I'd like to acknowledge the financial and staffing commitment made by the Crawford School of Public Policy to the Indonesia Project as another partner and invite Professor Helen Sullivan, Director of the School, to introduce the conference's first session. Thank you. Helen. Thank you very much, Alistair. And uh, um, as a relatively new director of the school, 
Um, it's an absolute delight to see uh, so many people here um, who are much more experienced than me, I guess, in the, the life of the Indonesia project. This is uh, one of many projects that the Crawford School supports, um, but it's certainly the project that has uh, uh, been around for the longest and has uh, perhaps the most powerful legacy. Um, and I uh, look forward to working with Blaine on um, securing the resources that the Indonesia project needs um, well into the future. So um, I was delighted to be asked to, to come and chair this session. Um, mindful as I have um, of time, uh, I'm not going to take up any more of yours, uh, but rather um, move straight into introducing uh, our stellar uh, discussant panel this morning, um, if I may. Uh, uh, we have with us uh, one of the, uh, the current uh, stellar stars of the firmament um, of, of Indonesian and Asian studies, uh, and also, uh, as is the way with ANU, uh, a rising star. Uh, so we have the present and indeed uh, the future um, before you. Um, the panel will work as follows. Uh, Professor Hadiz will, will speak, he says, for about half an hour. He's very keen to encourage discussion. Um, and then Tom Power will um, offer some comments and reflection on uh, Vedi's presentation. We will then open uh, the, the panel up for discussion um, and have as many questions and, uh, and conversations as we can. So I'm going to be very tight uh, for time, uh, which may well mean me waving various bits of paper at our speakers. So if I do that, please don't be alarmed. Um, but to begin then, we have Professor uh, Vedi Hadiz, who, as many of you will know, is a distinguished scholar um, of Asian Studies, uh, currently Professor of Asian Studies and Deputy Director at the Asia Institute, the University of Melbourne. Um, and Vedi joined the University of Melbourne about six months before I left. <laughs> um, so you didn't leave because of me. No, I didn't leave because of you. So we, we had some time to get to know each other, uh, but not too much. And so I'm particularly pleased this morning uh, to invite Vedi to, to address you. Professor Hadiz. <laughs> I like to walk around. <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, okay. Uh, so this thing goes. Okay. All right. uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this. Uh, now, the first thing that uh, came along in my mind when uh, you know, I was supposed to talk about this was all the somber analyses about Indonesian politics. <laughs> that have been coming out recently. And uh, they have actually, what is it, uh, been contradictory to uh, all the analyses that came out in 2014. And to me, that's really interesting. And so I think what I would like to do really is to put forward a few major arguments about what's been going on the last year, rather than you know going through a blow, blow, blow account of events. but to talk about these events and specifically say what I think is important about them. Okay. So, first thing is, I think in the past year we've seen that uh, there's been this, uh, what is it, uh, new oligarchic forms of uh, competition. For Closer to the mic, okay. Uh, okay, new oligarchic forms of competition. And in a way, this is not completely new, obviously, but I think that it's taken a new sort of importance, whereby uh, really it's factions of oligarchic elites that are competing for, with each other for power and resources. And identity politics, I think, has been an increase, become an increasingly important instrument in that competition. It involves the mainstreaming of conservative Islamic, you know, sort of values. Uh, why? Because uh, I think, you know, if you have the common denominator, which is uh, your conservative, most simple uh, interpretation of Islam, then you're likely to get more people. But also because it has the capacity to bring people together, 
who might otherwise be against each other. Uh, so this appeal to Islamic morality brings together different, really the diverse ummah of Indonesia, because it's actually become increasingly diverse, but united by you know, sort of a uh, common, uh, what you might call it, uh, 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 morality. Now, the thing about this is that uh, the response to it has been, you know, Jokowi's uh, hyper-nationalism. And we see that uh, in the sacredness of Pancasila in all of his speeches recently, uh, generals going that uh, democracy is not good, is not suitable for Pancasila. Uh, and these sorts of things really that for me, you know, and I am uh, not quite as old as Hal <laughs> uh, or, or Tony uh, but, uh, or, or Chris, who I'm glad to see you again. But I am uh, sort of really getting on. And I do remember that in the uh, 1980s when I was a student activist, this was precisely the sort of discourse that I was against. And now it's being put forward as being progressive. And there's nothing for me, yeah, at my age now, that is more irritating and annoying than that. <laughs> uh, so on the one hand, we've got Islamic you know, uh, appeals to morality which is, okay, everything has to, do, uh, has to be done according to the Islamic way. But the thing is, what it does is, you know, besides appeal to a broad constituency of, is, uh, of the Islamic Ummah, it feeds into that long-established uh, self-narration of perennial marginalization that informs you know, the understanding of the Ummah. And it goes all the way back to the colonial period in the Sarikat Islam, right? And this is the historical memory that they're really sort of digging up. Uh, and the consequence of, you know, Islamic morality and that narration of self-marginalization being responded to by Hype, what I call hyper-nationalism is really what I say, what I call the accentuation or the deepening of the already illiberal uh, illiberal sort of tendencies within Indonesian democracy, which I think is long established. I mean, I know that uh, there have been debates uh, which I have been involved in about the nature of Indonesian democracy, how inclusive or exclusive it is. But I think few people will disagree with me that you know, the reason I call this the year of the democratic setback is that I think few people will disagree with me that Indonesian democracy has now become more exclusive and that the problem is that potentially it is not just a passing phase, that it may actually become uh, a, a, a feature which is more long-lasting than, than we'd like it to be. And that is, you know, as an Indonesian, as a scholar, uh, my, my main worry. Uh, so we might get uh, really, uh, you know, we already have it really, but more so, I think, than ever before a system whereby you've got you know, elections, elections, and elections, and elections, and they're fine, you know. I, I don't take elections for granted. I grew up in the New Order, <laughs> where, you know, elections were, were fixed and, and rigged, and nobody, everybody knew what the uh, results would be. So I don't take elections for granted. But elections uh, that, you know, basically help to secure the social ascendancy of these uh, oligarchic elites that are in competition with each other, uh, uh, while at the same time, uh, I think, relegating to the background the aspect of rights that we associate with democracy, especially the most vulnerable people of Indonesian society. So uh, that's how I begin this very happy uh, <laughs> and very optimistic and very, very uh, <laughs> uh, uh, nice assessment of Indonesia. So where the hell did I put that clicking thing? <laughs> okay, all right. 
You know, I'm not as old as Tony, but I'm getting, getting as senile as he is. <laughs> Tony knows me for a while, he knows that. You know, I don't really mean it, although I do actually. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, I thought that would be a good idea to just uh, map out, and this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, you know, the paper talks about it a bit more. Uh, some arenas of conflict. Uh, and these include uh, yeah, one of our favorite topics, corruption eradication. So uh, if I were to go to a blow by blow account, we'd go, we'd talk about how there's this pansus who wants to uh, basically uh, uh, erode all of the uh, uh, powers of the KPK. And for me, uh, with all its flaws and so on of the KPK, to me, the KPK is probably the major symbol of success of reformasi, right? And to erode the KPK, and even recently, there's talk about disbanding it. And to, to see that people actually can get away with talking about that is, for me, a clear example of democratic set setback. And also a clear example of the fact that Indonesia's political institutions, its state, apparatus, its political parties, its parliaments, by and large, all right, by and large, are still dominated by predatory interests, old and new. Because who but predatory interests would have a stake in the dismantling of the KPK? All right? I mean, I think it just goes to logic. We had this famous symposium uh, in 60, uh, in, was it, was it April? Uh, uh, I forget, April or May or something this year, uh, which revisited 1965, and apparently, you know, the uh, Jokowi volunteers were, you know, quite, uh, you know, uh, encouraging the president to do, to do this thing, and they got a couple of generals to actually agree to do it. Uh, and I think uh, that some people uh, had some high hopes about what the result would be. But we saw that basically it came out with the conclusion that 1965 was the result of horizontal conflict that was going on anyway, although sections of the state apparatus may have been involved. To me, that is a very, very mild <laughs> formulation of what happened in 1965. And it was so mild, yet there, was, there were sections of uh, the military, including uh, military uh, retired people who go, hey, we can't take that. And they had an another symposium, which basically reasserted the new order narrative more in a more orthodox fashion of the events of 65. What does that show? Again, to just get to the point, it shows that there has been, in spite of all our hopes and so on, I think, including mine, there has not been this big rupture with, with, with the new order after 20 years of democracy. <coughs> Why? It shows that the people who are still dominating the discourse on politics in Asia are the people who have a vested interest in the new order narrative of what happened in 65. Even though some of these people are dead or whatever now, you know, well, the people that were socialized in the same institutions, the military, the parties, the mass <coughs> organizations, and so on, they have a vested interest in the uh, 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 reassertion of this sort of narrative. Because why? You know, I, I, you know uh, there are f mutual friends of ours, uh, Mari, <laughs> who I remember, you know, we, 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 have, we, we had a talk, this was years ago, 15 years or so ago, and, uh, and there were a couple of people, at that time I was still, you know, fairly young, <laughs> uh, and, and we were going, no, th we need to reassess all of this. And then this, these guys who were involved in the 66 student movement go, no way. If you reassess this, if you change this, I'm walking out the room. 
Why? Because their entire history, personal history, yeah. after 65, 66, depends on this narrative. Why would they have gotten all the privileges that they've gotten over 30, 40, 50 years if they hadn't been on the right side of history? Right? And same with the Muslim groups who are supporting the military uh, interpretation of this. Right? If we hadn't really saved Indonesia from godless communism by, you know, being part of the massacres, uh, what would God say to us? <laughs> yeah, we have to believe that we, you know, that we did what we did was right. And what our fathers and grandfathers, you know, in Enu or whatever, did was right. They have a personal stake in this, and they still dominate. And we see that, you know, another arena of competition, uh, of competition is just the idea of, of rights, which goes up to the heart of, 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 of you know, some of my arguments here. Let's talk about the LGBT community, all right? Again, you know, you know I, I still remember in Indonesia, where, where I grew up, where you, you know, we would pejoratively call people banji, but we would not mean violence. There was no violence that was, uh, you know, that accompanied, you know, uh, that pejorative term. I mean, it was a ni not a nice term, definitely not. It was a humiliating term, but there was no violence. There was no, you know, intent o on actually destroying a person's life. And, uh, and prohibiting the person from accessing rights that other people in the community have. There was none of that. And now we have that. We have the rector of the University of Indonesia, we have the Minister of uh, Research, Technology, and Higher Education going, no gays on campus. And you get away with that. You get away with that. Of course, you know, with the, uh, what is it, same-sex marriage thing going on here, Australia is in no position to be. <laughs> uh, 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 religious minorities, obviously, the Ahmadiyya and so on, you know, uh, the Shia now are being uh, 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 persecuted. Uh, Extapo, still, right? Uh, women. I mean, of the perdas that, uh, that the Jokowi gov government had uh, rescinded, and now I think they don't have the right to rescind anymore, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, how many were about the perda sharia? I think close to zero, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ed. I, I, am I right? Were any perda sharia rescinded? Yeah, not that I recall. Okay? So, after 20 years of democracy, the rights of the most vulnerable people are still under threat. So, the Jakarta gubernatorial race, which I'm going to talk about, well, I have to talk about, because you, if, you go, if I don't talk about it, you go, uh, where was he for half the year? In, you know. <laughs> uh, so that showed social pluralism under threat. This thing that we're so bloody proud of, you know, Barack Obama comes over and goes, social pluralism, yeah, great. And yet, we have the, these you know, anti-Ahok uh, demonstrations, which you cannot, in your right mind, say didn't have to do with anti-Chinese sentiment. OK? And so just a bit, a bit of a prelude to the bigger picture that I will talk about at the end. Uh, what we have now, I think, is this. The harnessing of identity politics <coughs> and hyper-nationalism to the imperatives of intra-oligarchic competition. That is, I think, the new phase or newer phase in Indonesian democracy that we are possibly entering. And the fear I have is that it may be a more permanent feature uh, than we'd like it to be. OK? Uh, clicker, clicker. Right.
Okay, hey, no, no. The thing about using these things is that the instruments are always uh, much more sophisticated than my actual slides. <laughs> I've seen slides with pictures, and I don't know how to do those things. <laughs> uh, I like writing on blackboards. <laughs> so, uh, Jakarta gubernatorial race. Uh, you know, all right, uh, most polarizing and emotive election, I think, in Indonesian history. I don't know, I'll have to ask Tony. <laughs> uh, has it actually been a more polarizing one? I, not, that, not in my lifetime, anyway. Okay, your lifetime? 55? <laughs> 1898? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah, I would say most polarizing, most emotive, uh, 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 elections in Indonesian history, right? <coughs> Defeat of Ahok, definitely. The mobilization of his Islamic uh, uh, identity as well as anti-Chinese sentiment, right? And as I, as I began, as it has resulted in some somber assessment of Indonesian uh, uh, politics and democracy. The most somber, I must say, than I've read since 98-99. Uh, Okay. Uh, so, just on, in relation to this, I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, I think the two main interpretations of it that, that uh, and, I, and I really like both interpretations, I'm not just saying this because Marcus is here, uh, uh, you know, and he, and he can be quite intimidating. <laughs> uh, but that, uh, no, the, uh, it, 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 they emphasize different aspects of the problem. Uh, but I don't think they actually ignore the other side, right? I mean, some of you who followed this know that Ian Wilson, for example, uh, not for example, Ian Wilson's argument was that, well, Ahok had made a meal of it by his urban reju rejuvenation program, which uh, evicted large numbers of poor people who became uh, the social base for the, uh, you know, uh, 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 attacks on him, all right? Uh, uh, Marcus's uh, argument was that, uh, Re really, it, w it was the case that uh, because of the uh, debates that were going on, Muslims didn't feel that they, sh they could uh, uh, vote for a non-Muslim. So the religious aspect is there. I think both are there, and they're both interrelated, right? But, uh, you know, I think, again, without being in contradiction to those two interpretations, I think that uh, what we probably need to put into the equation is the fact that th the mobilization of these sentiments, where the class or identity base, would not have happened without these the imperatives of inter intra oligarchic elites uh, uh, competition. Right? It, they they harnessed, you know, and reshaped and articulated the grievances, the dissent, and all that, into a narrative that made sense for a few months. That's all they need, a few months. OK? Uh, how much time? Half an hour. Have I? OK. Yeah. Give me five minutes. I'm sure the audience will give you as much time as you like. Really? <laughs> Can I go to my Bob Dylan impersonation? <laughs> Uh, so after that, we've got, you know, again, deja vu to me, fear that democracy will open up the door for Islamic radicalism. Uh, in 98, 99, 2000, we heard quite a bit of that, actually. Demo you know, it was only Suharto's uh, uh, iron fist that kept the Muslims in their place. So now we've got democracy. Uh, the Muslims will overwhelm democracy. And the same arguments are coming up now. And maybe rightly so, in that people are insecure and, and worried, right? But a few points I'd like to make here, all right? The FBI and these sorts of organizations, yes, they have moved more to the center of the arena politics from the outer fringes, yet, they do not have the capacity to actually cultivate a loyal, disciplined support base amongst their social base, which is the urban poor. 
This is in contradiction to something like the Ikhwanul Muslimin in <coughs> Egypt, where they had the money and the capacity to provide social services, uh, and the medical attention, the, uh, clinics and so on, and, uh, and just the, the organization and discipline and capacity to cultivate a very deep presence within civil society. These guys don't. So, so in order to be relevant, they always need controversy. And it is intra-oligarchic conflict that provides that controversy. So there's a mutual symbiosis, they might say. They need each other. They found a niche for themselves in Indonesian democracy, which is to mobilize people on behalf of oligarchic elites who they'll pay them. Okay? So it is less about, I think, the Ahok defeat, the victory of radical Islam, than it is about a new phase in inter-oligarchic conflict which has found new ways of using better, in a, in a, in a better way, you know, all of these grievances and so on that are related to, you know, Islamic, you know, sort of uh, social memory and so on. Okay? So I've got to hurry before Helen loses. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay, I'll try to go this uh, quickly. Uh, why Islamic morality? Well, the thing is, it appeals both to urban and urban middle and lower classes. of Why? Because and I've written this in other articles about, about other, you know, more comparative articles. And I, and I think the key to it really is the broken promises of modernity. We have people who have gone from the villages, you know, gone to school, and better educated than 20, 30 years ago, and yet are stuck. They buy all of the consumerist culture that's all around them, but they know they can never go up to and there is no ideological lens to make sense of that. Islam provides something. Okay? Uh, Hypernationalism. It also obscures diversity. Right? Like, like the idea of the Islamic Ummah, it's as if all Muslims were the same. Obviously not. They have different interests depending on their social position. In nationalism, it's the same thing. You obscure that. Right? And this is especially important because of the absence of any liberal, social democratic, much less leftist, narrative of Indonesia. Name a liberal Indonesian political party. Name a social democratic Indonesian party. None. Okay, so all we have to make sense of this is either Islamism or nationalism. And both of these, you know, uh, 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 reformist liberalism or, or, or leftist criticism uh, is equally susceptible to this, uh, you know, attack, to attacks on the basis of Islam of hi or hypernationalism. Because they could be, you know, put forward as anti-Islamic or anti-Indonesian, which I've heard before, right? So, you know, this, the, this attack on the Hatei can easily spill over into the attacks it fought to liberals. I've seen it recently in Turkey, where I've recently done fieldwork, where the attack on the Gulenists have spilled over into the attack on, on, the, on the liberals, on the left, on the Kurdish movement, on trade union movement, on, on everybody. Okay? And this is the final one, Helen. <laughs> uh, oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Towards the bigger picture. Uh, the thing is that I think we need to remember, I always forget to do this, sorry. Uh, we need to remember that, uh, uh, that this is happening in a global context where actually liberal democracy is under threat. And you can read lots of books and so on about the erosion of liberal democracy. And to me, I think it does have to do with the contradictions of neoliberal globalization. But that's uh, another article I've recently written about. Uh, so the future of Indonesian politics for me is about really intra-oligarchic conflict that harnesses in different ways, different combinations of Islamic and hyper-nationalist cultural resource pools. These will be fluid. Nobody's really attached to it, right? 
and they will be as fluid as the coalitions themselves. We know that Indonesian political coalitions are very fluid. Right? It depends on what there is basically to steal at a particular point of time. Okay? So I think we'll have more of that. And it may come out in you know, expressions of things that we associate with populism, whereby there's a homogenization you know, of, of, of politics, whereby, okay, it's the people who are the umat, who are virtuous and so on, against the elite. It's the people who are the good nationalists and so on, against the lackeys or the foreigners and so on, right? And uh, I think the liberal impulse in Indonesian society remains as weak as ever and is not quite equipped to challenge them. So I think that come 2019, which, in which we might see Jokowi Prabowo round two, these sorts of things will figure. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think the, the idea of the broken promises of modernity is something that, that, that chimes uh, uh, with many people in many parts of the world. Um, for those of you who are standing and would like to sit down, there are seats in the middle. Um, so while we, we change over speakers, if you, you would like to sit, sit please do. Um, and now I'd like to invite Thomas Power to come and uh, lead us in some initial thoughts and reflections on uh, Betty's presentation. Thomas. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Helen, and thank you, Betty. Um, first off, I have a confession to make. I've attended a few Indonesia updates in the past, but this is the first time I've had the privilege of being asked to speak. And I think this would be a little daunting even at the best of times, but all the more so when following from Vedi, who given his vast reserves of academic capital might be described as an oligarch of <laughs> Indonesian studies. <laughs> and this is all the more so uh, following such a conceptually rich presentation, um, as we've just heard. It's especially interesting to consider the events that Vedi has described, events that many of us followed quite closely, in relation to these deeper structural phenomena that we've heard about. In particular, the entrenched and competing interests of wealthy and powerful elites. I agree that the most troubling uh, political development of the last year is not the unprecedented sectarian mobilization that we saw in Jakarta per se, but rather it is the extent to which Indonesian democracy now seems to be caught between these two deeply illiberal forces. On the one hand, Islamic chauvinism, and on the other, hypernationalism and of course the absence of a credible liberal pluralist alternative, as Vedi has said. But I want to take this opportunity to consider two issues that arise from Vedi's presentation. The first of these relates to a still open and extremely important question. That is, the nature and the extent of elite support for the sectarian mobilizations that colored the Jakarta election. And second, I want to consider how Jokowi's approach to the exercise of presidential power may have contributed to the polarized and confrontational politics on display over the past year. And whether these events mark a turning point in his approach to the presidency. So I'll start by turning to one of the major themes of Vedi's analysis. And that is the central role played by intra-oligarchic competition in the Jakarta elections. And more particularly, in the unprecedented mobilization of identity politics that so colored them. The three gubernatorial candidates to contest the Jakarta election could be seen as proxies for national political leaders. Ahok for the president and his governing coalition, 
Agus Yudiono for his father, the former president SPY, and Anis Baswedan for Prabowo Subianto, elements of the Soharto clan, as well as Vice President Yusuf Kala. And indeed, it would appear that Kala was the chief advocate of Baswedan's nomination, lobbying Prabowo and PKS uh, to ensure he was a candidate. As Vedi indicated, the elites backing Ahok's rivals are also seen as having supported the mobilization that targeted the governor and his allies in the presidential palace. However, I feel we need more concrete evidence about the nature of their support, and in particular the extent to which the unprecedented scale of these mobilizations can be explained as a function of the material and logistical sponsorship provided by these elites. This is important because it allows us to better understand the mechanics of oligarchic influence in contemporary Indonesia. Specifically, it would offer insight into the extent to which money poured into mass mobilizations can set political agendas and swing electoral outcomes. More so than Ahok's allegedly blasphemous comments themselves, it was these demonstrations that I think played the decisive role in ensuring that blasphemy charges were laid um, and that identity politics came to dominate the Jakarta election itself. And in late 2016 and early 2017, sectarian mobilisation shaped public opinion rather than merely reflecting it. So on the one hand, we have good reason to believe that political support was forthcoming from elites alongside material sponsorship. For instance, Yudi Ono's personal religious vehicle, Majlis Zikir Nur Salam SPY, was reportedly involved in the mobilization of protesters. It was alleged by Ahok's defense team that Yudi Ono had privately requested the MUI fatwa that deemed Ahok's comments blasphemous, that is the fatwa from the Indonesian Ulama Council. And the former president's performance in a now infamous press conference a couple of days before the 4th of November demonstrations in which he denied his role only served to uh, deepen suspicions that he was actually involved, particularly guilty display. <laughs> and similar accusations have attached to Prabowo, to Kala, and to other political elites uh, who are rumoured to have provided transport um, and accommodation for tens of thousands of demonstrators travelling from outside Jakarta. On the other hand, however, we also have plenty of evidence of demonstrators mobilising organically, that is, travelling to Jakarta under their own steam, convinced that Ahok had insulted Islam and must be held to account lest his powerful allies offer him protection. The fact is, we simply do not know which pattern of mobilisation better explains the scale of these rallies. And we also need to further investigate the interplay between organic self-mobilisation on the one hand and elite-driven mobilisation on the other. If it is indeed the case that the protests were largely elite-driven, we could conclude that a model now exists for a very direct and very effective form of elite manipulation of political discourse and electoral outcomes. On the other hand, if sponsorship was not the decisive factor in the scale of the protests, we may in fact conclude that the pivotal moment in the Jakarta election was the product of self-organised popular mobilisation rather than instrumentalist oligarchic control. The second thing I'd like to reflect on is why the established patterns that Vedi has identified, particularly intra-oligarchic competition and illiberal tendencies in Indonesian democracy, have taken a particularly polarised and confrontational form under Jokowi. One reason, I would argue, relates to Jokowi's evolving approach to political coalition building, 
and in particular, the way he has approached the forces of conservative Islam. Compared to his predecessor, SBY, Jokowi is clearly a very polarizing president. Yudhiyono was hypersensitive to potential sources of instability. He maintained an extensive and patronage-drenched coalition in order to preemptively co-opt and prevent potential sources of discord, to mencegah kegaduhan, as he might have said. Yudhiyono bought stability by incorporating even relatively radical groups into his support base and through this patronage web. By way of contrast, when Jokowi came into the presidency, he did so with a stated belief that he could govern without needing to maintain this sort of highly inclusive patronage-saturated coalition. And through the first two years of his term, he accommodated a much narrower set of interests than we had seen included under SBY. Most notably, Jokowi refused to engage with the more conservative elements that SBY had cultivated. The Indonesian Ulama Council, for example, faced marginalisation. Meanwhile, organisations such as FPI and even the Prosperous Justice Party were excluded altogether. This less accommodative approach was even evident in Jokowi's dealings with the major mainstream organisations, NU and Muhammadiyah. Here, relations remained cordial, but channels of money to their elites, which SBY had long ensured remained open, dried up. Their access to the president was also much diminished. Many of the forces that had been excluded under Jokowi were, of course, uh, heavily involved in the protests against Ahok. And it would seem that in the aftermath of the Jakarta election, Jokowi has come to better understand the reasons for Yudhiyono's extremely inclusive approach to building a coalition. Indeed, he's taken on elements of Yudhiyono's approach. Projects are now being fed to NU, land is being opened up for Pesantren, meetings and religious events are now regularly held at the palace. There was this beautiful image I saw a few weeks ago of Jokowi chaperoning and chauffeuring a group of ulama around the grounds of Istana Merdeka. Ma'ruf Amin, the man who issued a fatwa that deemed Ahok a blasphemer, now seems to enjoy a particularly cosy relationship to the president. Yet in his dealings with religious elements that Jokowi considers outside the Indonesian nationalist mainstream, he's moved in the opposite direction. Not only does he want them uh, not accommodated, Jokowi actively seeks to repress them the banning of Hata'i, as Vedi has mentioned, and of course the exile of uh, the Islamic Defender Front leader, Rizik Shihab, are unprecedented, um, unprecedented events in the almost two decades of democratic rule. Jokowi's political preferences, I think, seem to have played an important role in this illiberal shift. Now, I think Vedi has made an extremely compelling case for the central role played by oligarchic forces in developments over the last 12 months. Yet there are inevitably more questions for us to answer. In explaining the demonstrations, we need to know more about the interplay between grassroots and elite-driven mobilisation. Meanwhile, in explaining the responses of the Jokowi government, we must further our understanding of the relationship between the president's personal preferences the influence of allies and advisers, and the influence of the oligarchic structures that permeate Indonesia's uh, political, um, uh, political environment. And of course, when it comes to answering questions about Indonesian politics and society, there are a few better places to do it than the ANU Indonesia update. <laughs> so hopefully we can, uh, we can find some answers over the next two days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas, for uh, both responding but also uh, opening up some additional 
avenues for discussion. Okay, we have um, a very good amount of time for questions, thanks to the efficiency of our uh, presenters. Uh, we have some roving microphones. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're going to take a couple of questions at a time. Please be brief. Please don't make long speeches. And please try and restrict yourself to one question. I know it's hard. Right at the back. If you could identify yourself, that would help too. Yes, uh, my name is Irwan Sinaga. Um, this question is for Pafedi. Pafedi, it's, uh, I enjoy the presentation. That's a... Uh, that's, uh, uh, enjoyable presentation. I just would like to seek your opinion because you don't touch on on the issues. Um, the update on Indonesian foreign policy and what's this oligarchy can influence the uh, um, Indonesian foreign policy. Thanks. Okay, do we have another question um, down here in the middle? Collaboration with the microphone is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Fedi and Mas Thomas. Um, my question is about the hoax and also Saracen. They are very popular at the moment in Indonesia. Can you give us sedikit gossip about that? Who is behind that? <laughs> And what is the influence with the uh, presidential election for 2011, uh, 19? Thank you. Well, my name is Betsy Phillips from CIT. Thank you. Um, and one just here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This, my name is Rainer Heufer from the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies. A question to Pafidi as well. Um, you spoke about the sense of marginalization among the urban middle class. Could you explain a little what, you, what, comes, what uh, took you to that conclusion? Okay. Yep. Okay. I think that's enough okay. to be going on with. Mm. Uh, on on foreign policy, um, I, I, re I recently published uh, uh, an article which I wrote with Richard Robeson. Uh, it came out in the Pacific Review. It's called Indonesia: A Tale of Misplaced Expectations, uh, and it had to do about it had to do with uh, the idea of Indonesia. It, it was a critique of the idea that Indonesia would play uh, a vastly greater role in regional and international politics and economics uh, because simply it's become bigger as an economy. And the critique of it centers on the idea really that uh, the Indonesian political economy is actually very insular. Yeah. And the interests of those that dominate Indonesian political economy is actually very insular. Uh, in spite of you know investments here and there and connections through you know sort of networks you know of 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 of, of uh, businesses in the region and so on, really the bulk of the money is taken in Indonesia by hook or by crook. You know, uh, including the dark economy, you know, uh, deforestation and all this stuff. So, from that point of view, the oligarchy really doesn't have a lot of interest in foreign policy, and that's why I think Indonesian foreign policy uh, uh, tends to be uh, very not robust. Sorry, Mr. Ambassador. <laughs> uh, 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 it, 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 I don't think it really has. Uh, I don't think it really has a uh, a clear end game. You know, except you know to be to have Indonesia to be more respected and play a bigger role in in ASEAN and 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 so forth. But the bigger question is still, what is ASEAN for? Mm. You know, uh, so that's my my answer. The oligarchy doesn't really have a lot of interest in foreign policy. Okay, uh, in terms of the hoaxes and so on, I, I don't have special uh, uh, access to these sorts of things. Uh, 
Uh, I am, you know, I don't, I'm not even on social media. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I have had a, a recent PhD student who wrote about uh, the, 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 the influence or the role of, uh, of social media in uh, several elections in Indonesia, in Makassar, uh, in Jakarta 2012, was it? And also the national elections 2014, in which the argument is that there is an industry that is developing here, and that this industry is servicing the interest of, of the elites. Partly because you know, the ownership also sort of overlaps and so on, but also because it's it's lucrative. And again, this is not just Indonesia, as you know, right? Cambridge Analytica is doing this, you know, for for, for Donald Trump and for God knows who else, right? Uh, on uh, the urban middle class, look. Uh, uh, you know, if, if you go to you know most macroeconomic uh, 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 sort of surveys of Indonesia, you'd see that uh, the middle class is uh, what 43, 45, or even 53 percent of the population now. Uh, but and you know, Dede and Mari might correct me on this, but uh, I once did a little bit of uh, analysis of that data, and my conclusion, although it won't be as sophisticated as yours, is that probably about 70% of that 45% are on the borderline of the definition. And therefore, they live a very precarious existence. What that means is that they buy into all of you know, the consumerist culture, the idea that you, work, you study, you work hard, and you advance, and yet they, they, they live and encounter a world where you don't advance unless you have the connections, and you know, you know, and, and they'll have schoolmates who are stupid and and multi billionaires, you know, uh, and I think this does uh, feed into that sense that uh, well maybe we should well you know in a way it makes them able to identify with the poor, and yet have the dreams and so on of the people that they can't really emulate. And this creates, I think, a great existential <laughs> crisis. Uh, uh, and there are colleagues of mine who have written about this. Uh, uh, you know, Ross will know that Inaya Rahmani wrote a book about Islam and the middle class uh, in Indonesia related to uh, popular uh, cultural consumption, which argues exactly this, actually. Okay. Um, yeah, perhaps I can just add something on the question about hoax news and, and uh, Saracen. Um, as Vinny said, uh, we see social media increasingly play this sort of uh, very pivotal role in Indonesian elections in recent years. Um, and if we think back to 2014, you know, we saw a lot of memes online, a lot of things being shared on Facebook and Twitter, being published by uh, VOA Islam or PKS Piungan, that suggested that Jokowi was a closet Christian, that he was actually Chinese that he was um, a communist. And I think in the lead up to the 2019 elections, it's clear that Jokowi and his supporters want to ensure that this sort of narrative um, doesn't sort of spread on social media and, and influence the outcome of that race. So my, my suggestion would be that with this crackdown on social media, really, this is geared towards accounts and bots that are spreading this kind of uh, negative message about Jokowi and, and fake news about Jokowi, uh, rather than necessarily those that might um, be, be similarly propagating uh, more sympathetic messages. So it's, it's very targeted, I think, this crackdown on social media. So it's, it's not surprising that Saracen was the target. Thank you. OK, we have time for another round. We already have one at the back. Yeah. Now, I'm looking at an audience that is, by my reckoning, 50% female. So I would like the questions to be equally so. Um, uh, that's changed things a bit. <laughs> yep. OK, we have a question here. So we can get a microphone to there. So would you like to ask your question? All right. Yeah. Uh, my name is Harun. 
Uh, my social media, media name is Harun Al Rashid. Uh, what is beyond oligarch? But it is not my question. My question: What is missing in this presentation is, I'm not surprised if uh, you do you know or not not, uh, not SBY, but uh, SBY and Prabowo using the Islamism. Actually, it has been established since. 1965. Can you hold the microphone a bit closer so we can hear you? Thank you. All right. I'm not surprised with the successful of uh, SBY and Prabowo in using the Islamism in recent Jakarta election. Uh, but, but what is, has been missing in this presentation, actually the military elements of the Indonesian uh, government has been effectively used uh, the element of the Islamists since 1965, since Gus Dur and until now. I, th I think this is the big picture that has been missing this presentation, included from Hadith and the other one. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have a question here. Yeah. Um, thank you. Excellent, uh, excellent presentation. Tastes like coffee, actually, very good. My question <laughs> would be, do you have like two cents uh, on the role of the army on our, uh, our Indonesian politics nowadays? Thank you very much. And we have another question. Yes, ambassador. <laughs> I think the ambassador gets to ask a question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first to Pa Fedi. Pa Fedi, could you kindly uh, elaborate more uh, how liberal the Indonesian democracy should be, in your opinion, mm -hmm. and what kind of yardstick that we use, we should use to really uh, measure the level of freedom, the level of liberty in the Indonesian democracy, and do you think that the result of the election in Jakarta the other day would have been different if uh, Ahok did not say anything uh, in uh, Pulau Seribu the other day. And also, do you think that the November demonstration mm -hmm. could have happened during the New Order era? <laughs> uh, yeah. And I'm a uh, I'm a Catholic, I belong to the minority, and I never feel that my right is to deprived. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, off you go. Uh, yes, uh, on the military, uh, actually there's quite a bit on the military in the paper, uh, but that's no excuse for forgetting it in the, uh, in the presentation, so thanks for reminding me of that. Uh, uh, and there's actually two questions on the military, so maybe I should just combine it. Uh, yes, uh, you're right uh, that SBY and Prabowo has, you know, uh, has a longer history of using, you know, Islam, and the military does. Uh, but yeah, this I think provided the basis for this. You know, developments, uh, you know, 2016, 2017. I mean, the reason that Prabowo is able to uh, have these uh, connections, you know, which uh, Tom is going to investigate further with the grassroots organizations, is, is because of his role in actually cultivating them in 97, 98. Right? I mean, if you go back to the uh, late New Order, Prabowo was positioning himself within the, the, the Islamic community and the Islamic organizations, right? So that's, so, so that's that sort of history he was able to make use of. Uh, but you know, the thing about the military and Islam is that one of the things that has always, you know, I always talk, when I talk to the Muslim activists, you know, after you know, things relax and all that, I said, how many times would it take really for the military to fool you before you understand that they're always going to fool you. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's constantly happened, you know, that they ally themselves with the military and then they get smashed. That's, that's just been repeated in Indonesian history. Now, uh, with, with, you know, the role of the uh, military today, I think that, uh, you know, I think that 
one of the great things about the Reformasi was that their official political role you know, retreated, right? They were no longer in parliament and so on, although you know, we do know that their businesses and so on at the local level continued and all that. But I think right now they actually are, are seeing, well, it, it, you know, there's an opportunity to, to not inch back, but maybe to, to, to go back by meters rather than by inches. Uh, and you can see this by the positioning of people like Gatot Normandio, who are, uh, sometimes he's pro-Islamic, <laughs> sometimes he's pro-nationalist, you know, and, and obviously this fellow is posi positioning himself or, or, you know, or, you know, sort of canvassing the possibility f to enter politics directly. All right, so I think that one of the things that we're seeing now is that the military is uh, seeing this as, a, as an opportunity to... Uh, to gain, uh, to attain more influence than they've had in Indonesian democracy than, 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 than in previous years. Uh, how liberal do I want it to be? Uh, well, you know, I could have a long list of wants, but you know, in analyses, that really doesn't matter, I think. You know, I don't actually uh, use what I want as the basis of, of what I analyze, because it'd just be too depressing, really, because <laughs> what I want never actually happens. <laughs> Uh, uh, but uh, at the very least, uh, I think that, uh, that if Indonesian democracy were progressing rather than regressing, we would have better uh, 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 protection of the rights of the most vulnerable people of Indonesian society. And that is not happening. It, uh, more, more than before, I think they are, uh, uh, they are vulnerable. And you could have, there's lots of yardsticks, obviously, uh, you, know, you know, the international yardsticks. But one of the things that I would like to repeat is that my view, actually, is that the Indonesian story is not unique from a global story. I think all over the world, liberal democracy is being eroded, including here in Australia. Tom? Um, yeah, just perhaps a comment. Uh, a comment on the potential for sort of a military resurgence in politics. Um, Vedi mentioned Gatot Normandio. I think Gatot is a very interesting case in that he blends this kind of hypernationalism with the uh, is Islamic chauvinism that we've seen on display in recent times. But Gatot's also, I think, a genuine challenger uh, to run in 2019, potentially as a vice president. And indeed, if we looked at the latest data from CSIS, I think I'm right in saying that despite a little spike for Jokowi's popularity, the next three people on that list of most electable politicians are all military. We have Prabowo, uh, Gatot, and Agus Yudhiyono. So, yeah, I think that's interesting. It just shows that there is this perhaps groundswell of support uh, for people who are associated with the military um, in some way. Um, uh, and maybe this question about whether we would have seen something similar in oh, Jakarta I forgot, without... I forgot to answer that one. I, m should I let you, uh, you, you go through it? Do you want me to answer that? Uh, oh, I, I think I, the ambassador would like you okay. to answer it. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I think that, uh, that uh, uh, Ahok really shot himself in the foot. And, and that what he did really was provide the best ammunition possible for his opponents. Uh, if we, if we remember, you know, a, a year prior to the elections, he was considered almost unbeatable. And then it, it was the Almeida thing that, that changed everything. And I don't think that the November things could have happened during the New Order, unless it was orchestrated by the New Order. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have time for one more question down here. Is there a microphone? We need it right down there, to the third row. Lydia, do you have anything? No. Nothing of interest on social media. <laughs> OK. Chris Manning with some connections with the Indonesia Project and with Jogja. Uh, question to Vedi and perhaps to Tom as well. Um, Vedi, it's strange for me to hear you speak and not mention organised labour. Uh, you mentioned the urban poor and dissatisfaction of the urban poor, but you didn't talk about the so-called working class. Mm -hmm. two, two issues come to mind. Uh, one is 
do you think that this group has also been behind some of the, the uh, demonstrations and the political activism in relation to economic dissatisfaction? And secondly, in regard to political alliances, have they become, particularly organised labour, particularly the, the trade union, the, the more radical trade, or I won't call them radical, but more better organised trade yeah, unions, yeah. have they formed closer alliances with PKS and with Garindra, mm. and so uh, have become more of a force? Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. Okay, this is, you've got oh, is a very short time oh, for okay. a response. Yes, sorry, the first time I came to uh, the ANU, Chris helped me on, you know, on, in my research on labour, so yeah. Uh, so, uh, as you know, the organised labour has much greater freedoms than they ever had before, but they are also extremely fragmented, right? Now, of the better organised uh, 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 organizations, they are at a level where I think they can be co-opted, but not really in a position to demand, you know, sort of uh, uh, rewards, right? So again, their role really is in the mass mobilizations. Uh, the PKS, a couple of years, a few years ago, tried to get into organized labor because also the uh, if you go to Tangerang and Bakasi, you know, they're much more religious now than you know, 20, 25 years ago. So they thought it was the, with, through the Pangajians and so on, they could develop this, uh, this uh, working class constituency. But that hasn't been successful, really, because they can't provide the sort of you know, organization and services and so on that workers demand, right? The FSPMI, which, which I think you're talking about, actually has links to the old, or links to people with links to the PRD, right? But uh, it, it has gone together with, 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 with Prabowo. And I, I think that, uh, yes, they have been involved in some of these, you know, uh, 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 you know, public mobilizations instigated by the Prabowo camp, and possibly, you know, the the the, uh, the tearing down of the pro Ahok flowers and so on, with where workers were, were doing that. That was prob probably them. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. A um, couple of, uh, of instructions I've been asked to to uh, to give you, or re requests rather than instructions. Um, T will be outside unless it's raining, in which case it won't be. Um, the, please uh, do take time to network and have conversations. I know there are, are, are lots of things to talk about, but please be back here um, in a timely manner for the next session that starts at 10.40. But before we do any of that, please join me in thanking Betty Eddy and Nicole.